Okay, in this lecture we're going to continue our discussion of faulting and we are going to, uh, I'm going to go through normal faults and so we want to remember we can characterize them in terms of their horizontal stretch, what they do to crustal thickness, their regional elevation, some of the important regional characteristics and other issues we have to remember when we're thinking about normal faults. So, important thing about normal faults is that they they bring younger uh, down over older. We often see them in rifts and they uh, are formed under conditions of continental extension. So here this really beautiful uh, brown and white layers from Iran that show this really nice uh, down dropping of these central blocks uh, bounded by these two inward dipping normal faults. And so you see really clearly that these younger rocks have come down and are juxtaposed against the uh, older ones. The other important thing to see is already we recognize this, the normal faults are steeper than reverse faults. And if you recall our uh, lecture when we explored this in this classic Andersonian sense with uh, relatively high friction, we would expect that the normal faults optimally would have about a 60 degree dip. Okay, so we'll, let's look at for a moment is just remember where the, the a lot of normal faulting occurs is in mid-ocean ridges. And so this view of global topography and bathymetry is just going to take us a tour, on a tour of mid-ocean ridges. Here's the mid-Atlantic, which clearly is a zone of extension as in the, down here Africa is pulled apart from South America and there's active extension at that ridge and that drives volcanism, material flows up from the upper mantle, and we make new oceanic crust. Here we head down to down south of Africa and see the southwest Indian ridge that uh, extension is occurring along and um, we have spreading. Now we're down deep here looking at the southern edge of the Indian plate and southeast Indian ridge. just below New Zealand now. It's a ridge that separates the Pacific and the Antarctic that we're going along. And it's important to recognize these ridges are, are zones of extension and then we have the transform faults that separate them along strike. And we'll talk about transform faults in our next lecture. Sometimes when these uh, plate boundaries come together into a triplet, we call them a triple junction. Here we're coming along the East Pacific Rise and it heads basically right up into the Gulf of California which is a, our local extensional system separating Baja from mainland Mexico. Just to continue on that vein, we've shown this before, but just to remember you know, what the consequences of this extension are, and that's the formation of ocean basins like the Atlantic. And so you see the colors show us that decreasing age of oceanic crust as we approach the mid-ocean ridge. So we can kind of talk about when when the continental crust is pulled apart, we call that a rift. And um, in, so we sort of have these comparative riftology. So the upper view is a, a view looking south along the East African rift. And you see the AFR triple junction in the middle ground there. Uh, the Gulf of California is in the middle. We see that oblique extension as we pull Baja away from mainland Mexico and, and basically up in the northern part of Baja is the uh, San Andreas system here and it's uh, part of the same uh, overall motion of, of Pacific Plate northwestward relative to North America and um, Baja has been basically attached to the Pacific Plate. And then importantly, at the very end of rifting, we build what we call passive margins. So eastern North America, as we saw in our earlier video, pulled apart from uh, actually western Africa 180 million years ago. And since then, it has subsided as it cooled and allowed for significant sedimentation to occur. So here's the East African Rift. Just um, kind of showing a little bit more detail, uh, we can see that it, it actually varies quite a bit along strike with uh, 
you know, the Afar Triple Junction up here in the north and all these triangles show volcanoes. You can go into the main Ethiopian rift, um, then it heads on down into Turkana and this eastern branch in Kenya. And it's in these uh, rift basins of Kenya and Ethiopia that are quite important for the study of human origins because as rift basins, they accumulate lots of sediment uh, that basically entombs the fossils, but also the volcanoes give lots of volcanic uh, deposits that we can easily date. And so this is a great place to look and study the evolution of humans. The uh, rift steps over and has a western branch heading through sort of the edge of uh, Congo uh, and on down to Lake Tanganyika and then m to Malawi and onward. So one, one thing we can see is if we look at this plate tectonic view of the development of the Red Sea, which is up there on the, uh, as we've pulled Arabia away from Africa and this Somali block, um, we can see that the, on the left here the number of kilometers it would take to pull these back together. So they haven't moved that far, just a few, you know, up to 160 kilometers or so. But uh, you can see over time, over the last 20 or so million years, we see this kind of crustal thinning that's fairly uniform, crustal and lithospheric thinning. But then it starts to localize more and more, and we really get a lot of thinning, especially of that, um, of the, the sort of uppermost mantle, the base of the crust, and then we get crustal thinning. And true oceanic crust begins to form. So we really pulled the continent so far apart oceanic crust or basalt comes in, we make new oceanic crust. The important thing to see is this significantly extended continental margins on either sides, and it's this this extended continental margin that's the beginning of a, of a future uh, passive margin, and, and it's that salt that's uh, that often found there at the bottom, and the early sedimentation that now is this important um, oil plays. So that's why Brazil is, for example, becoming quite an important global economy is because they're finding a lot of oil that's accumulated right above this extended uh, continental crust. Of course, that was, you know, f formed more than 150 million years ago. So the simplest way to think about it, uh, extension and normal faulting is, is this kind of analogy from this famous experiment by a geologist named Ernst Close. And what he did was put this clay cake on a rubber sheet. And as he pulled the rubber sheet, it extended uniformly, kind of a ductily and uniformly extending lower crust. And above it was that clay. And even though we think of the clay as can flow, under these conditions, it actually localized the deformation. And we had lots of little faults form. And so you, if you recall the beginning of our class when we talked about these circles that deform into ellipses, that kind of gives us a, a sense of this, you know, if you stand back far enough, it looks like pretty uniform extension. So once we've uh, pulled the crust apart, sometimes things get a little bit more complicated. Um, what we can see up at the top is we have this, this, uh, these two sets of normal faults that dip toward each other, and so that block drops down sometimes like a keystone. And the, the valley that forms, or the, the area that has subsided, is called a graben. And there's actually two of them. There's this one and then the other one. And between them is, is the opposite, is, is a block that's bounded by outward dipping normal faults. So it doesn't subside. It relatively uh, is elevated. And that's called a horst. So you can see that these the bounding faults, it, the upper part of the system has steep Andersonian. So in other words, sort of optimal dips. Uh, but as we go down, there's this uh, weak detachment or place where we can sort of detach this upper crust from what's below. And in this case, it might be a salt horizon, but it could be some other ductile level. And our faults decrease in dip, and they kind of root into it. And so in 3D, we see that below. And so this down dip curving or shallowing of the dip is, is called listric. And listric is, is just a kind of means spoon shaped. So um, really just in the sense that as you go into your spoon, it, it shallows as we go to the center of the spoon, the edge of it. So here's a, some experimental development of, of a normal fault system. So there's a lot of work trying to understand how normal faults uh, evolve in the laboratory. And so we might 
basically put some clay or other material that's uh, behaved somewhat brittly um, over a, a, an extending sheet, just like close did, and then pull, let's say, from the left. And so in this case, this grobin starts off fairly symmetric. But as we pull on it more and more, we kind of develop this asymmetric half grobin. So it's, it's well, maybe a little bit redundant to say asymmetric and half grobin. It's an asymmetric grobin or a half grobin. And what we see is on the right side there, the main fault uh, stays localized and we get almost all the deformation along that single fault, whereas on the left side, all the uh, right dipping faults may accommodate in the end the same amount of extension, but it's distributed across a number of faults. So just as a, an example of, of a, a, a kind of an earthquake that occurred along a normal fault and, and also tying into uh, North America, there the uh, the basin range, so the area of kind of western Utah, Nevada, lots of uh, Idaho and also uh, eastern Oregon are zones where the crust is extending now, especially in these belts. And so there's this intermountain seismic belt that goes along the Wasatch of uh, Utah, but also goes up into Idaho. And there was an earthquake in 1983 up here in Idaho called the Bora Peak earthquake. It was a pretty large event, magnitude 7.3. And there was uh, one, I know one uh, boy was killed very sadly in a, a town nearby. Um, but it really shook everyone. And But it was also well studied by scientists. And so here it is. This is, it's basically this mountain range on the left there. And we're looking south is called the Lost River Range. And uh, so you can see this person is standing next to a, a break in this alluvial fan surface. So this is the fault scarp that formed during that earthquake. It was more than two meters of abrupt offset of the ground surface. So a couple more pictures here you can see just looking down um, that fault scarp heads off into kind of along the base of the range here another view of the scarp and what's important to see is actually this the scarp kind of lays back above so there was a scarp that was there before and that was about probably think uh, another earthquake similar to this one occurred about 6,000 years ago so this fan surface had two offsets in it it's very uh, very interesting so there she is you can see you know the free face formed in, uh, in the last earthquake but this little bit of break and slope behind was probably formed in the prior event. So here you can see this is uh, the earthquake displacements that were measured by uh, leveling. So kind of like a, we would use GPS to do this now, but the horizontal axis is distance perpendicular to the fault. And uh, in the upper part here is elevation change. And so they were able to measure these points and show that uh, near the fault, the valley went down by almost 1.2 meters, and the range went up a little bit. Um, and then when we looked at the seismicity, we saw the main shock was down deep at a, uh, more than 15 kilometers deep, but it aligned with the zone of aftershocks that goes right up to where the fault scarp was seen. And then if you look at the overall geology, we can see that this Thousand Springs Valley is full of young alluvium, and then Bora Peak range is uh, uplifted older rocks. But what's important is you see this TEV. These are tertiary volcanic rocks, and they're found on the backside of Bora Peak. So they kind of give us the long-term total offset, which is you know m about five kilometers. And so we see that that occurred. You know, it's kind of occurring earthquake by earthquake, a few meters at a time. So this may take a few million years to develop from a geologic sense. And here is a view of, of that uh, same earthquake in map. And the uh, place that I showed the pictures from um, was just right in, in where this near this uh, spot here where the survey crossed the, the road. And so what's important to see is that the fault uh, trace was, was fairly straight along the in this case, this is the south southern part of the rupture, but then it broke uh, significantly up here, and and it was quite discontinuous. 
Now what was also interesting is down on the bottom here we can see distance along the uh, rupture and the vertical offset. So this was people who went out, the geologists went out and measured and uh, so like where where I showed those pictures from was near this double spring pass. So that's about two meters that that woman was standing um, adjacent to. But some of the offsets were even a little bit higher, more like 2.5 here at Rock Creek. Uh, but then it went, you know, it was kind of variable. That's what the dots are showing. Um, but uh, overall, there was kind of this peak of offset of about two meters, and then it tapers down somewhat asymmetrically, a little quicker to the south, and then it kind of drops down. Um, more gradually going north. So this is a kind of a classical view of what happens in an earthquake is that um, you know it, it has a peak amount of offset that tapers going away but it has ends and so we need more earthquakes for example to fill in those gaps so that over the long term we would have kind of steady block motion along this fault. And that's uh, what this is showing then is is and we sort of saw that in the last picture with the end of the Bora Peak rupture is that you might start off with a simple isolated fault, but it has these tips. And so if we plot distance versus displacement, have some displacement profile. And in this case, it was it's symmetric. But we saw that for the case of Bora Peak, it's not always symmetric. And then as we get an array, so we might have a couple of normal faults that aren't continuous, so they, they have to step between them. And so that step between the two fault segment tips is called a relay ramp. And uh, we see here in the upper right that you know this is shown there's some amount of separation. That's the perpendicular distance between the tips. And then the overlap is, is how much one overlaps the other along strike. And down on the lower left, you can see a 3D view of a relay. And it turns out these relays are quite important for um, kind of the continuity of uh, drainage networks. Sometimes rivers will go around and down this relay. It's also a way for fluid in the subsurface to migrate, and so these are of great interest for petroleum geology. So one thing that happens then, we can see if we plot, if we go back to the displacement versus length profiles, we can see, uh, you know, each one of the fault segments might be behaving sort of fairly uh, simply in the sense of having this single peak of displacement. But when you add them up, they start to almost look like a, a single continuous one. So here's just a view of that uh, blow up of the, the relay ramp. So here's a, another view. Things can be a little bit more complicated. Um, this, the last picture I showed had the, you know, both faults were sort of dipping the same direction but we can have a case where the faults dip away from each other, and so we have an antithetic interbasin ridge. Uh, we can have this synthetic relay. That's what we pretty much were just seeing. Here's a transfer where we flip the dips and, and another one. So this fault in, um, interaction can be more complex, and if you go back to East Africa, we see a lot of this different kinds of behavior with some simple relays. Here's a good one here but then more complex transfer zones, uh, long faults that taper and uh, displacement. And so it, you know, in nature, it's somewhat more complicated and that gives the rich kind of uh, and spectacular view of the geology of fault systems like we see in East Africa. Okay, so sedimentary rift basins then are really important because they, uh, are these elongate crustal depressions and they fill with sediment so they they uh, kind of capture the record of what's going on around them um, and you know we may want to go look at sedimentary sequences and you know we may see this sort of asymmetric rift basin with kind of coarser deposits on the you know sort of side of the main fault and then get a little finer grained so we can choose kind of which part of the base we might want to look at and then we can learn you know, how rifting works, but then we might try to understand depositional environments from the sedimentary basins and then look at evolution. And so this is something that we're doing here at ASU. And in the end, it all goes back to understanding what the normal faults are doing and how they control the sedimentation. 
So now let's talk a little bit more about the geometry of normal faults. So here we are. These are these kind of classic views of normal faults, very steep, uh, kind of like we've been talking about the Andersonian steep orientation, um, and usually in arrays, some you know dipping the same direction, and then other ones we say synthetic that that dip is at, uh, dip parallel, and those that dip opposite are called antithetic, um, but all high angle. Now let's look at this one. This is a really important study that was done in, in a place called Yarrington, Nevada. And the work was was oriented, uh, first came out of a, a study looking at the economic geology. So the mineralization around Yarrington is very famous uh, for gold and, and other metals. And But as a geologist worked there to try to unravel the really complex geology, uh, which we see actually here at the present, you see you know these layers just all over the place. And so they mapped it very carefully in great detail and what they were able to show uh, was this sequence of events that occurred starting in the kind of late Oligocene, early Miocene with these uh, big eruptions of uh, Oligocene ignimbrite, ignimbrites that were overlain by andesites. So normal faulting occurred, maybe that was a, kind of associated with the volcanism or the volcanism was associated with the normal faulting and so for a, a million or two a few million years, these normal faults developed and, and continually sort of rotated the blocks and accommodated the extension. But what's important is around 17 to 11 million years ago, those that first set of normal faults rotated kind of like dominoes and uh, they became fairly low dips. And so after a while, and if you th uh, think about it, there was more normal traction on them than shear had been before and so they were kind of harder to slip so new faults formed back at that kind of steep classical Andersonian angle and continued to accommodate the extension and those uh, that second set even rotated some so here we, we can show that with our more circle the uh, up here in the upper left we might have our optimally oriented faults that are forming but over time they rotate and so they become less well oriented and then we would have a second set form again, again with optimal orientation. And this rotation comes, you can see this picture of these dominoes, is that as we accommodate extension and we have so many sub-parallel faults, each block bounded by the normal faults kind of acts like a domino and the whole group rotates together to uh, allow the domain to extend. So we can see that here with uh, on in A is kind of the domino style normal faulting, and then B shows the kind of classic sort of uh, listric kind of shallowing dip uh, pattern of deformation. But you can have this what they call a rollover here or this reverse drag. Now we can imbricate the um, listric system, and so we have these little. Uh, slivers along there that that are rotating but also have their dips decreasing and then we can have kind of this mixed listric faulting with a dominoed uh, set of blocks that uh, are kind of in the main hanging wall so the, a lot of this is relevant locally because we see these structures in Arizona and at first uh, they would be mapped and what what the geologists would see would be this kind of pretty high-grade metamorphic rocks uh, kind of in this core of a range, so even like the South Mountains, surrounded by a bunch of, of faults. And so for a long time, they didn't know what they were until they mapped them really carefully. And then what they could see was that it was actually consistent with the model shown here. And that is that we pull the crust apart, and actually we pull it along on this low angle normal fault that goes down deep into the lower crust and it's um, uh, kind of the upper end of it ha gets steeper and is more Andersonian um, but that upper block the hanging wall is torn apart and all these uh, blocks rotate but also sedimentation may continue pull the thing apart more and more and ultimately that that lower uh, the foot wall is basically lifted up. It turns out it uh, gets a little bit more buoyant as we pull it apart. And so it, it rides up. And basically, it makes it look like we have two 
normal faults that dip the opposite directions, but it's actually the same normal fault that has just bowed upward uh, into this core complex range, um, and and the, and then the fault zone sort of continues on either side. And so if we go back to this picture here, we can see then um, that evolution where we have this, you know, the main breakaway fault that's the head of the whole system on the far right. Uh, but then the basal fault kind of goes up in the air over our um, core complex and then down in a kind of more typical normal sense with this broken uh, hanging wall and then maybe some secondary sedimentation in these small basins. And so this is the model also that we have for uh, Greater Phoenix where uh, the South Mountains are the core complex and these sedimentary basins on the side of it are actually what people think um, the uh, area around the Phoenix Zoo is the, and also the Camel's Head. So those red beds are about the same age as the South Mountains fault zone, and there the sedimentary basins were filled with debris that was shed from the nearby uh, fault blocks that were exposed as part of this extending uh, crust. So one, a couple final points. One is that here, if we have a sedimentary basin that we're extending, and uh, so this is this picture here shows the kind of pre-rift in in this kind of black and white zebra color, and then the sin rift means it's sedimentation that occurs at the same time the zone is uh, is rifting, and then post-rift would be after the faults stop moving. We we kind of cover the whole system up. But, you know, the faults don't go away even once the fault they start slop, stop slipping. And if we shorten the whole system, we, we basically reverse the sense of motion. We literally get reverse faults by reactivation of our normal faults. But we also basically lift up the, the old zone that had been subsided. And this is called basin inversion. And it's a occasionally seen and can be quite a complex thing to interpret. And so this is, you see the scale here, five centimeters was something that was explored in, a, in an experiment. So as we come back then to our uh, simple summary of fault description, normal faults extend the crust, so their horizontal stretch is greater than one. They make the crustal thickness less, so it thins. The regional elevation is lower and that's why they capture so much sediment. Uh, these rifts are important uh, regionally. Um, Mid-ocean ridges are a classic example. We have this gravitational collapse. The main uh, source of stress, the sigma-1, is vertical in these systems, and it's due to the weight of the overlying material. And there sometimes we'll see uh, normal faults along strike-slip faults uh, in zones of localized extension. And then the issues for normal faults um, are as we just mentioned, detachments or metamorphic core complexes, this lystric behavior, the fact that the blocks might rotate, uh, as we showed with the dominoes and the Yarrington case, and then also the importance in the sense of rifted margins and how they may persist for quite a long time and, and be economically significant. So just comparing with thrusts, you can see the um, important differences as we flesh out this table.